Hello, everyone. Welcome to Small Bot, uh, Small Talk. Oh, my goodness. I'm so pleased to welcome back to the show, Yonina Lynn uh, Curtin. Welcome back, Yonina. Good to be here with you again. I'm going to call you Nina, if that's okay. You can, yes. <laughs> now, well, I know some of the things you are. It's a Métis Atlantic poet, an author, a facilitator, um, manuscript consultant. Did we? I don't think we talked about that, did we? Uh, I actually don't think we did. Yeah. So tell me about that. How does one become a manuscript consultant? That's a very, very, very good question. And I think a lot of people uh, aren't aware of the fact that they can become one as a writer. So as a writer, you're training, uh, you're taking classes, you're reading stuff, you're learning how to write better. And in so doing, you can become a good reader of other people's work. And so then you are a manuscript consultant. So you can help them. They call it developmental editor sometimes. So you're not necessarily a copy editor. Mm -hmm. A copy editor is someone that really knows grammar. That is not me. <laughs> I need a copy editor. Um, but generally, if you're being published, your uh, publisher will pay for the copy editing of your book because they have their own style guide. They know exactly how they want certain things said um, or worded the types of words that they use, how they spell them, everything. So I am able to help people develop their manuscript. So I can work from at an early stage where they just have an idea and they'd like some direction and help on uh, how to go proceed. Hmm. Um, sometimes it's that they've already written something and it's a hot mess, which most first drafts are. Mine is, everybody's is, it's kind of like, you just spew out a bunch of stuff and you're not quite sure what yeah. belongs, what doesn't, how to make it flow, how to structure it. And so I would help with that. Uh, for me, it's part of the what I've been learning, but it's also a very intuitive process. Okay. All right. Yeah. So uh, I, I'm assuming now to get in order to get clients, um, it's like by word of mouth or how do people find you? Well, it's interesting in the beginning, People like publishers would ask me to edit or developmental edit with uh, poets because they knew I was a poet. Right. And I didn't know if I could book fiction or nonfiction, but then for a time I was one of the Vancouver Manuscript Intensive mentors. And through that, we would do a six month process with somebody. And I worked with fiction and nonfiction and found that I could do that as well, which kind of makes sense. I mean, I've been reading my entire life avidly <laughs> and I do know you know, what works in a book and what doesn't. Um, having said that, there's things I couldn't work with. I'm not an academic. Okay. So you know, this is not like a memoir uh, is something I can work with. But even now I'm getting to the age where it's memory is a bit of an issue. Mm -hmm. And so working with a full length fiction or nonfiction manuscript can be daunting because you have to remember every little thing are these things lining up? Did they explain someone to have blonde hair in one position and then later black hair? Like you're really looking for those um, things that can be easily missed. Mm -hmm. uh, something not as obvious as that sometimes, but does it make sense? Is it flowing right? And you have to be able to maintain the whole story in your head. Yeah. Which means then you have nothing else that you can have in your head. So it's not well paid. And so then you're taking this amount of time. Mm -hmm where you're, you're not able to write on your own work, you can't work on your own work, you can't work with someone else because you really have to, for me, it's hard to hold all that. Yeah. So I'm not doing much with fiction and nonfiction, but poetry, I'm always game. <laughs> I love working with poets. Is there a big difference be with working with a, a poet or somebody, whether it's fiction or nonfiction, when you're mentoring or consulting? There can be, yeah, for sure. There can definitely be poets. Um, not all poets are the same, just like not all fiction writers are the same. But the poets that I tend to work with are people who are often telling their stories wow. and who have difficult stories to tell. And so uh, part of that is supporting them with that and helping them to see where their poetry is maybe too, almost not too much. Like, so if you want to make a point of something being really sad or really hard, don't have to make it really loud you can be more subtle and so poetry is often more subtle mm -hmm. and you don't have to have details you can gesture towards things 
Mm. Like, whereas with fiction, you have to have details. He did this, and then I did that, and then blah, 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 right? right. But with poetry, you can create an atmosphere. So you create an atmosphere which is of dread or doom or happiness or whatever it is. And maybe that includes some details, but right. in no way is it the same as with fiction or nonfiction. But just think about like when I was years ago when I was in school and we always took poetry, of course, um, that some of the poets, and I can't remember who off the top of my head, but their poems would be so long. Yeah. You know, now, is that ever an, an issue? I'm not really a fan of older poets. I'm not one who, who looks to them very much. I have tended to look to more recent poets and I'm more of a free verse poet myself. And I use it as a narrative to tell a story. And so I tend to work with those types, other people who work in that way. Right. So if you had like strict formats, like sonnets or something like that, like I'm not your girl. <laughs> All right. I've written one sonnet because I had to in a class and I just, it was, and I was complaining about sonnet in the sonnet. <laughs> so. Yeah, so it's it can be difficult because um, does it need to be long or does it need to be short? A lot of times poetry, because you mentioned how long some of these older ones were, and not to say that they weren't beautiful and that people don't still love them. It's just not my way. Mm -hmm. I tend to write shorter poetry and the average person that I work with writes shorter poetry. To write longer poetry is challenging and I am challenging myself to try to do that from time to time. But generally, poetry succinct. That's the beauty of it. It's succinct. It's very cohesive. It's tight. And so for me, that is often a short poem. Now, there's other people who've done a wonderful job of, you know, creating a whole book that is just one poem. Wow. Okay. That's talent. Yeah. Like that takes a lot of talent to keep the interest. Right. You know, yeah. I would think so. Oh, my goodness. Wow. So, um, now, part of what you, you do, like uh, the developing of an editor in the manuscript and uh, mentoring, so you're you're helping writers, whether they're poet or, or fiction, emerge into themselves, right? Or into what they want. Is that, am I reading that correctly? Absolutely. So it's not about what I like and what I want. It's about what I'm able to work with. And, and so I can't work with everyone because I don't have the capacity or the skills that they need. Right. So... I always begin with an interview that is a free consult. And so with the free consult, it's 20 minutes generally, I ask for pages of writing, like maybe 10 pages of writing if it's poetry. Okay. And I read the poetry to determine, well, is this something that I, I have something to offer this person, like some feedback. And then during the interview, I find out whether they and I are a good fit. Uh, not everybody can accept feedback. Like they ask for feedback, they pay for feedback, but they can't accept feedback. Yeah. And so with those people, I have to really determine, can I still be of help? Like will a small amount of feedback and possibly grow that feedback as we get to know each other, is that going to be, well, I feel like I've given them their money's worth. Mm -hmm. Some people have a very hard time accepting feedback. And I yeah. understand that I was one of those people. So I began and I just, all I knew was how to write a poem. I didn't know how to revise a poem. And this is a lot of, we're talking about now as revision as well, how to make that poem better. So I wouldn't know how to revise it. And when I received feedback, I couldn't accept it because I didn't know what to do with the feedback. And so my writing mentor said, when I give you feedback, I want you to make a new document and put all the feedback I've given you in that new document and look at both sets of poems Hmm. And what I found out in that was that, oh, yeah, some of what they say makes sense. Some of it did not. And that is normal. Some of it didn't make sense for me. It's perfectly good feedback. <laughs> and so I started to see, oh, so when you do this, that happens. So while you're receiving this feedback, you're becoming a better poet if you can accept and okay. start to work with things. So the next time you look at that thing, I would hear Betsy's voice in my head. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I know what this is, and I've used coded words, she would talk about it. So, you know, I was a recovering New Ager, so the universe showed up a lot. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And the kind of language that we would use, she'd be going, uh, no, 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 those are coded words. Um, explain what you mean by that. Expand on that. Uh, you can use those words occasionally, but to lean on them too heavily uh, is, means that you're not really giving the reader right. a sense of what you mean because what does the universe mean to you as opposed to me 
may be very different. Right. Uh, now, you mentioned also that uh, that you, um, you work intuitively, or part, part of what you do, you work intuitively, right? Yeah. So with everything I do. <laughs> everything you do. Okay. So, but it has to be with, like, I don't even know how to ask that question. Um, obviously, it's not just total, totally that way, right? It's a matter of skill. And the more skill and knowledge you have, the more intuition you have available to you. So it's like having pathways for things to come through to you. So you still want to learn about things like the editing process and what might you might want to consider when you're editing a pro editing. I call it re, actually I call it revisioning. So it's revising, but I think of it as revisioning the poem. Revisioning. Okay, that makes sense. I like that. That sounds good, right? Really, you know. Totally. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's kind of interesting. You know, I, I was just thinking about the way people write. Like I've never. I've, I wrote a kid, a children's story, a very basic child's book. And, but I was, when I was with Toastmasters, so you had to write speeches all the time, right? And I found that very easy to do because it's very limited. Yeah. And you have your voice, you're talking. So you have that to add to this, what you're saying. Yeah. So I guess what would be the same thing, like in, in, with poetry in a, in a way, it's your own vision of something, right? Absolutely. And so that's such an, a critical piece. So when I first meet with that person, that first consult, I ask them what their vision is for the book. So what is it that they're hoping to write? Because what we hope to write and what we actually write might be two very different things. So help them to get closer to that vision of what they have wanted for this book um, is what you're doing. Yeah. Right. And, and when you said with your own um if I think back about how you worded it with your own uh, poetry, like you don't, you're not worrying about rhyme schemes for yourself when you're writing rhyme schemes or any of that, whatever those structures are. Yeah. It's more about rhythm and we each have a different rhythm. And so when we critique other people's writing, we need to really understand what their rhythm is. And so that can be very affected by culture, mm -hmm. the music you listen to. Um, and so a lot of times for non uh, white writers, their work will get critiqued in a way that is not actually accurate because it's the grammar. Um, there might be a different sense of how we say things. You right. Know? So, you know, we have little sayings that may not be perfect English that we might be adding into our pieces, and those are valuable. We don't want to correct those out. I did have someone try to correct my first book a lot. I ended up in tears. I was really confused and I was a brand new writer. I'd never have been through an editing process. And I phoned my mentor and she said, okay, give me some of the feedback he's giving you and let me see what's going on. And she looked at it and came back to me and said, he's trying to correct your prairie indigenous way of speaking and say, no, no, that is not gonna happen. <laughs> That's part of your voice. And so the poor fellow was not a poet. That was the second thing. So he's really going in for the grammar. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> and, you know, poetry doesn't have to be grammatically correct. Yeah, yeah. And our voice may have that part of our culture in it. It might have more than one language in it. So we might have some of our own language in there as well. Right. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. Well, now just, you know, it, again, it reminds me of, you know, I'm just taking all these things in and the way I do things like, uh, when I first started my show was with, with Shaw TV and the young man there said, oh, how would you do it this way, this way? And, I'm, and I said to him, well, that's your show. I'm happy to do your show for it, to MC your show for you, but that's yeah. not mine, you know, yeah, right? You have to stay true to yourself. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Now, you mentioned now with your own poetry, how much Icelandic you goes into it, how much Métis goes into it, or, or that must vary a bit, I would think. Yeah. It does. Um, well, I've only been to Iceland once. And so my connection to Iceland is even recent. I just went in what, five years ago to Iceland oh. for the first time. And my grandmother, whose name I have, Jonina, mm -hmm. she was Icelandic 100%. So right. to my knowledge, she, I didn't know if she even spoke Icelandic. But when I was in Iceland, I realized she had an accent I never really noticed. You know, you're a kid, you don't realize that she yes. had the Icelandic accent. And she may have very well spoken the language, but I, I don't recall. My, my, I do know she spoke it, but around me. Okay. So I have much more of a connection to the Métis. I lived in Manitoba a good portion of my life. 
Um, I am a Manitoba Métis. That is our homeland. Right. I have a deeper connection to those relatives. Mm -hmm. My mother's brothers and sisters, of which there were many. She was the old second oldest of 17, uh, 16 of which lived till very late life in life. Right. Right. But we never connected in the same way. I love them. They're my aunts and uncles, but I felt connection to the Métis. I looked more like them. Okay. Um, I felt more like them. Yeah. Uh, they were more comfortable for me. They were more welcoming, um, warm, not harsh. Whereas Icelanders I found in my family could be quite harsh. And when I went to Iceland, I began to understand why. Hmm. I began to understand they live, this is a survival, like to survive in Iceland, you don't have time for a lot of emotions, I guess you could say in a way, like you have to get things done. They were poor farmers once they got here, life was not easy. It was my great grandmother that came here. Uh, from Iceland as the nanny and maid to her brothers and half brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. She was a result of an affair. So she had a difficult life. And so right. you can just imagine that yeah. of course they weren't, and they didn't have that same sense of community that we had as the Métis. That's really interesting because yesterday, this hasn't aired yet, the uh, uh, interview I did yesterday with uh, his Métis. Um, he's in Ontario currently, and um, he was saying, in Ontario, like the Métis are not connected or they weren't connected like they were where he comes from. Was it Manitoba? I've forgotten where he was born. Yeah. Where they had, like you said, there was such a strong community, but even within Canada, yeah. you know, all the Métis have strong communities. We do. Ontario is questionable at the moment. And so there's a lot of a lot going on around who is and who isn't really Métis. Right. I'm an actual Red River Métis, which uh, means that I am from the Red River settlement. My family was part of that. There were land scripts and our things. And there are some who believe that that is who the Métis are. And so some of the people who, in, who are in Ontario, and he may well very, may very well be a Red River Métis, but he's moved to Ontario. That's different. But if the people who think that there is Métis in Ontario are not accurate. Right. Well, he may was, have yeah. blood. So it's really complicated because my cousins also live in Ontario. And of course, they belong to the Ontario organization because that's where they lived. Right. At one time, you had to join in the province that you lived in. So only recently have you been able to join the Manitoba Métis Federation, which some feel is kind of like the gold standard mm -hmm. for Métis. Others are not happy with the, some of the things they're doing. It's a complicated soup. I'm in BC. It's not the same. I yeah. love the community. I really love the community here, but it's not the same. Um, it's different. It's different. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, and it's complicated. For sure, yeah. I know in, in Chilliwack here, we have, uh, well, one of my friends, uh, Peter Lang, uh, is a past president of the Métis uh, Association here in Chilliwack. And I got one of these because they every, every Sunday we have a, a market, farmers yeah. market, and they have a table there. And I actually was given... Um, oh, the, the warrior. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Beautiful. I have one of those, yeah. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Because I'm, you know, I'm, for me, it's about learning. Yeah, yeah. You know, I love I, that about you. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. Because, <laughs> well, I think it's important and to understand a, a person's different, a culture that is different, you have to learn about them, right? I can't just make that, make an opinion. I don't think I should make an opinion without learning something yeah. you know, about, a, about a people and their culture and whatever, you know? So, um, and, and one of the things I know, like uh, uh, when I talk, spoke to this other person yesterday, um, talking about, you know, how, how it was a struggle for the Métis to get to be get their status, right? Yeah. yeah, citizenship, we call it, actually. Oh, okay. Citizenship, okay. Uh, what's involved in getting your citizenship? Well, it's it's evolved over the years. And so I once had a citizenship, and then we did call it Métis status at that point in Saskatchewan. Okay. My cousins were the enumerators. <laughs> Oh. And they knew my family lineage. They did the first check to see, oh yeah, your grandmother is a is a golden. Oh yeah, you're a, you're a Métis. Um, I never thought to check my grandfather because I assumed that a curtain was English. It uh, turns out he's also Métis. So I found that out much later. So to really find out, um, like first you need to prove your lineage. So you need to, most of us go to the St. Boniface Historical Society for that. Mm. It's in okay. Winnipeg and in St. Boniface, and they have the records 
of the churches and various things. And so my, neither of my grandparents had birth certificates. Right. Um, they're probably born, maybe even born in North Dakota or maybe even born in Turtle Mountain because I have family that were there. Mm. Um, who knows where they were even born for sure. Anyway, they, they can use the church records like for baptisms, for weddings, mm. different things. And so they figured out, they give you your lineage through mm -hmm. those records, right? Also through, of course, the other records, birth records and things like that, if they're available. Right. And then they can give you your lineage and then they can tell you who in your family got Métis land script. I think we had eight in our family that had land script. And, um, it, and I was told that our lineage was one of the more interesting ones that he'd ever done, the guy that did it ours. Okay. Was so it, it, oh, sorry, go ahead. go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, you take that and then you apply with a Métis organization and they're not all created equal. I've been part of a Métis organization that turned out to be not the true one. Mm. So then I have to apply to the other one. Right, so it's right. really confusing. So right, currently oh. I am a member of BC, Métis okay. National BC. Uh, I was just wondering if it gets complicated because like I was trying to find out, somebody told me that my, my maternal grandmother was was First Nations. Um, yeah. The problem is with my, my, my maternal grandfather had been married twice. So yeah. the names of the women the, yeah. His wife, one of them got changed. Um, I forget what the last name was, but it went from something to Peters. And it's like, okay, so what was her, you know, or did they mix them up? You know, and, and that's some of the issues sometimes, right? Absolutely. In my book, I talk, uh, all my books, I think I've got poems, certainly in the last two, last one for sure, um, about my great, great, great grandfather, who was the famous Métis person in BC. Right. And now I find out he may not be because there was two wives with Peter Curtin and I there so, someone thinks I come from the other lineage and so I've been asking the St. Boniface Historical Society they said oh you have to start all over again and so I'm in the queue for them to redo my lineage even though they were the original ones that gave me right if it's inaccurate the wrong one so it's complicated with those yeah. types of things uh, indigenous women are not named like I have people where it says uh, Louise Assiniboine, that's probably not her name. She was probably an Assiniboine mm -hmm. and they put her first name and what she was there. Or it just says American Indian. So it is complicated. Yeah, for sure. D does that, does that, uh, do you incorporate any of that in your poems? Yeah, I've, I've got um, a lot about like the notion of blood quantum, because there's also how much, how Indian are you, is what people would say to us at times. And of course, I'm using that term in the old ways that we've been mm -hmm. taught. And, you know, the percentage, like, does that matter? What matters, you know? And so it's a very, very complicated subject. So I've written about it. I talk about how the Métis hid. And so my family said that they weren't Métis, right. even though they were visibly, my dad was visibly Indigenous, but he was say, he was French and his mom was visibly indigenous, but she would say she was French. And I talk about how in the poems and stories, I write prose as well, what the impact of that was also for me as the person who comes along later, who happens to be dark. So when I'm living in Winnipeg, I'm definitely dark. I, I don't need much sunshine. <laughs> <laughs> I've gotten old and living 35 years in this rainy place. Yeah. I, I don't tan like I used to, but people always ask me what I was. Right. So I write about that. I write about the change. Like there's one poem, thinking of, it's not a particularly poetic poem, but it's about one of my ancestors who his censuses begin with him saying native and then they end with him saying Catholic. So in the, as the years progress, he stops saying that he's native. Okay, right. I thought you were going to lift, pull, up, pull up one of your books there. <laughs> yeah, I was just trying to remember the poem it's not the most exciting uh poem it has a picture of the census um which i just want to see like i write a poem titled like what are you anyway because people would constantly ask me what i was right and when i was young um so i've got a poem like titled who owns this land the complication of being metis and being in bc and uh, this is not my land Right. You know, yeah. Yeah. Yet many Métis, we experienced diaspora, so we were chased out of places. We lived on the edges of the cities. We had. Yeah. So I write about those types of things, um, yeah. the feelings that come from that 
so the poem about my great grandfather, grandfather, I don't know how many greats, it's called erasure. Because I think a lot about erasure. So we've been erased from history mm. in many cases. So when you look up history, you barely ever hear about this John Baptiste Boucher, who I think might be my great, great, great grandfather, even though he brought Simon Fraser here, even though he was very important to the fort up in Port St. James, you, you almost never hear his name, even though he's mentioned daily in the Hudson Bay records. Instead, you hear about the white men who he was with. So erasure, we're erased from history. But then we're also, we're erasing ourselves. So here's my great grandfather, you know, Louis Golden the third. And um, tales told to census takers include some name changes. He began as Osh P. Ka Khan, becomes Louis Godin in five short years. My great great grandfather's census records go from native Catholic, one married man to Catholic, one married man. His Metis wife unnamed, listed as one married woman. Did my grandfather know that our indigenous roots would lead to me, a granddaughter born over a hundred years later? Did he know his granddaughter would look back, collect him and all the other half-breeds, as we used to call us, into her arms? Having known the pain of being unacceptably impure, when really all we are is the result of the love of thousands. When we talk of race, of the intermingling, why is it that we never talk about the love that brought us some of us together? Now, some people object to that because they believe that we were the product of rape, and some of us were. And some of the women were abandoned. Many of the country wives, mm. they call them, were abandoned. But some of us were a product of love. Mm. Yeah. I feel my family were very loving. Yeah. You know, I kind of, what you know, one of the things I find really interesting that why people are, were called half breed like like my ancestor when I think you know like when I did my DNA I come mainly from the Iberian Peninsula which one there's where? the Iberian Peninsula Portugal okay. and Spain those areas you know so they all obviously intermarried whatever that's yeah. isn't that the same thing like a joke okay, it's just the skin tones are different right yeah. so yeah. that be the same thing like <laughs> you know oh Jesus I mean, we just had this thing with uh, Kamala Harris with Trump saying what he said about her, yes. just saying she's a black woman now when she's always claimed both sides of her, her lineage, right? Yeah. And when you're a mixed race, and many of us are, let's let's face it, yes. and it can be even, let's not just race, but Catholic to non-Catholic, like people, you know, marry um, people who are outside of their culture. Mm -hmm. It's complicated for people like that. For sure. You know, when you talk about, uh, you know, in, in, when you're in a different climate, like uh, where it's a harder and your skin changes. Like when I was really little, one of my brother-in-laws used to call me his little black baby because I would get really, really dark, you know. Yeah. And I've been asked if I was Italian or, or Spanish or I have also been asked if I'm First Nations. Yeah. And and it's for, as you say, many people like and I don't understand how somebody somewhere along the line decided that you're lesser than. Yeah, it's really got a lot to do with color, right? So for whatever reason, it's very sad to me that uh, lighter skin is preferred. And so this mixing, some people are offended by that. That's why I use the word unacceptably impure in my yeah. poem, because that's how it feels is that, oh, now, but then the other side will also reject you sometimes because right. you're not um, Indigenous enough. So you're just getting a notice that we don't, we have... We have eight minutes left. <laughs> okay. Oh, um, well, that went fast, didn't it? Yeah, it always does. It just, be, you know what I think is just so fascinating that yeah. you just, I, you get, you know, I get wrapped up in listening to what you're talking about and I'm trying to think of a question to interject because I'm, I just want to know everything, you know? <laughs> right? You're very good. I, I appreciate Thank it. You. Thank you. Well, I love the fact that you you came back on and, and you know, I just want to say you're welcome on any time because I just, I need to, I feel like I need to be learning. Yeah, well, and hopefully, you know, people who are listening in also can learn if they have questions, because I think the Métis were the biggest question mark um, at times in this country. People don't understand our history, and our history is fascinating. Right. People don't understand that John A. MacDonald wanted to get rid of us mm -hmm. as much as he wanted to, you know, put the other First Nations in 
residential school, but he just wanted to get rid of us like as well. Like, so there was genocide towards us as well. Also in, 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 you know, when you talk about Iceland, like I can't remember the, the woman's name, but she, she talks about, she's from Iceland and how they, again, the same thing. They were not like the natives of the indigenous people of Iceland were not allowed to talk the language. They were not, not allowed, you know, the, and it's like universal. They weren't allowed to practice their religious practices. Well, they would think of it as more as spirituality, probably. And right. it's fascinating what they used to do. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, with that, I think we're going to end it there, but just stay on camera. So to the audience, you've been listening to Yonina Lynn uh, Curtin. And I just, again, she's a, a poet. Uh, she incorporates some some of her, her um, uh, Icelandic ancestry, but definitely her Métis history and uh, i don't know if i said that right but you know what i mean everybody <laughs> i'm not trying to be i'm trying to be correct but what i said but anyway thank you everybody for watching the show because i'm starting to ramble here you know time to move on and i uh, hope you continue the watching the show take care everybody and peace out thank you for having me thank you you're welcome and i just want to quickly let you know when this is going to air and as of course i will send you the link once it does right um it's going to air on the 14th okay. of this month, okay? And thanks again, and I really sincerely yeah. mean it. If you ever want to come back on the show, let me know or find a spot. Okay, thanks. Okay. Until then, bye for now. Bye.